So great pleasure to introduce Erica. Erica Rappaport is professor of history at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, she's probably perhaps best known for her thirst of, a thirst for empire book, which was an award-winning book on tea in the modern world. Um, she's also done shopping for pleasure. Um, Women in the Making of London's West End. I'm afraid I don't shop for pleasure, so I'm not one of them. <laughs> I shop out of need only. Um, and uh, she's currently writing White Mischief, Public Relations at the End of Empire, which presumably is what has occasioned the title and the content of this lecture. So over to you, Erica. It's a great pleasure to have you giving this lecture. Thank you, Jean. And I just also want to thank um, Kathy and all the organizers for this conference. Making it possible to be with you is really special. I was hoping to be in the UK in person, but um, such a slight. So let me start. I'm going to share my screen and make sure everything all works. And start my PowerPoint. How's that look? Is everything? You can see the PowerPoint? Great. Um, okay, so uh, I also want to highlight that the title of my paper on the small program was Tate or State. That's, that was just a typo. I think somewhere it's Tate, not State, which is important, as you'll see, to the argument that I'm making. Um, so I first of all, just want to say I'm not jumping from tea to sugar because it's a natural <laughs> move, but actually working on public relations and sugar has an important place in the history of public relations um, and the selling of commodities of empire during decolonization. So I want to start and have you draw your attention to this image on the right, of, which I found is a remarkable image of a West Indian sugar worker that I discovered years ago while researching my book on tea. And of course, it was one of those things that I filed away with material that I didn't use. But I found myself repeatedly returning to this arresting and deeply unsettling photograph, which I had seen in the house magazine of the giant British-owned sugar refining firm Tate and Lyle. So this smiling middle-aged man looking upward with sunlight illuminating his gleaming face, wet and shiny with a touch of sweat, is so disconcerting because it, is, it was used to absolve Britain of its colonial past and present, to erase the history of slavery from that of imperialism and to defend corporate capitalism. Published in 1961, just a year before Jamaican independence, Tate and Lyle's PR framed the viewer's gaze on this beautiful man's smiling face while cutting out the, his body and the history it tells from observation. This face assured shareholders, workers, consumers, and the wider public that their relationship to sugar would not change with independence. The British corporation, such PR explained, rather than the state would still provide Britons and Jamaicans with work and with the sweet life. So this sugar work workers photo is similar to countless images of labor, plantations, and colonial industry that permeated the business press and commercial advertising in these years. Such images are traces of corporate PR campaigns that sought to manage the processes and understandings of decolonization between the 1940s and 1970s. These campaigns shaped capital investments, promoted capitalist values, and maintained colonial era economic relationships decades after political ties were severed. So in my new book project, which I'm tentatively calling White Mischief, Public Relations, now I'm calling it Public Relations and the case for capitalism in the Commonwealth. I'm exploring how businesses and colonial and post-colonial governments hired English and American PR firms or created in-house PR departments to sell products, advance their political interests, and manage criticisms of empire and capitalism. While selling wool, wheat, sugar, tea, gold, electricity, oil, tourist resorts, and countless other commodities, a cadre of public relations experts made the case for capitalism in the Commonwealth between the 40s and the 1970s. During these years, the costs of war and decline of older industries, the rise of labor parties and social democratic welfare states, moves to nationalize and indigenize key industries, growing power of civil rights and anti-colonial anti -colonial movements, and of course, Cold War politics, challenged Great Britain's centrality in the global economy. 
and ignited a profound sense that capitalism was entering its dying years. Or at least that, that was the excuse many Cold War publicists used to sell their services. Capitalism in Britain has for many years been intellectually on the defensive, wrote Michael Ivins in 1967, four years before he took over as director of Aims of Industry, arguably the most right-wing PR organization in the UK. This story of crisis and restructuring is well known, but I'm interested in exploring how decolonization and the fear that capitalism was in crisis created opportunities for the growth of new industries, particularly that of public relations. PR solidified its legitimacy and expanded its remit by helping corporations maintain and even expand their influence in countries and industries undergoing decolonization. In this project then, instead of tracing the global production, distribution and consumption of a particular commodity, I examine the people and campaigns that affirm the place of Western capital and capitalists in new nations in the Caribbean, Africa and South Asia. I thus trace how PR grew into a transnational neo-colonial institution so well captured by this 1968 New Yorker cartoon. You can kind of read it as I move on. So as you can see in this cartoon, the men and women who went into PR donned modern garb and professed to have mastered new media technologies that could shape public and official opinion. They peddled expertise, commodifying their political, business, and cultural knowledge. Consultants, market researchers, journalists, directors of think tanks, and a host of other professionals also claim to be able to digest, sell, and interpret information in an increasingly complicated global world. In this project, though, I'm honing in on the men and women who declared that their imperial knowledge was especially valuable during the protracted, uneven, and violent unwinding of empire. Corporate PR often disseminated class, gender, and racial ideologies born during the heyday of imperialism. Such PR was building, in fact, on a long tradition of conflating as we'll see in the case of sugar, conflating whiteness with racial and commodity purity. In the late 19th century, for example, sugar refiners and settler colonies used anti-Asian racism to sell their products. Other industries, notice, notably tea and soap, similarly engaged in such commodity racism. In the 20th century, these industries added film and other new media to their sales arsenal, but they still use race to debate and shape political economy. The PR industry promised British companies it could help them secure personal relationships with elites and new nations, maintain markets for British ideas and commodities, and compete with competition from the United States and the Soviet Union. This could mean rebranding imperial commodities as national goods, as was the case for tea in the UK and in India. It also meant promoting former colonies as pleasurable vacation resorts for weary white people, such as you see in this, in this cartoon. Um, PR also fought socialism and moves to nationalize industries and infrastructure in the UK and in new post-colonial nations. Of course, such PR was not readily accepted. Its practices were often dismissed and ideas reworked by local elites and consumers. In this history, then, local communities were not, as Jonathan Karim Machado has told us, victims or mere agents in the agenda of Europeans. Before, during, and after independence, they rejected and in other ways attempted to assert control over um, commodities and the knowledge produced about them. The problem, however, is that they often did so by accepting the basic idea that colonial commodities and industries were necessary for post-colonial development. For the purposes of this workshop, I think my project helps us um, think critically about the archives and sources that we use to study and write about colonial commodities, global trade, and world history allows us to consider the cultural and political significance and context that produce trade journals, business histories, advertising, and financial news. While many of the authors of such texts did not think they were engaged in PR, they were effectively doing that as they define commodities, industries, and their place in world history. Even the familiar commodity chain narrative that so many scholars rely on today was already a framing device in 19th century advertising and was just as popular in 20th century PR. In other words, following a commodity from farm to table has long been a sales technique and a political tool, and one which suppressed as much as it revealed about commodities global histories. PR, often termed as an unseen or invisible yet pervasive power in the modern world, has been one of the most elusive and understudied of the persuasion industries, and one that is especially difficult to define. 
One of PR's founders explained that, quote, public relations is whatever the individual practitioner thinks it is. Well, elements of PR existed before um, the field first really expanded, though, and defined itself in the early 20th century United States, when large corporations used publicity and lobbying to fight government regulations and advance the political power of business at home and overseas. Politicians and public bodies then increasingly found it necessary to manage their image, lobby governments, conduct political campaigns, and generally ensure favorable media coverage. In interwar England and its empire, government agencies, military aid services, some large companies and industries, such as T, began to recognize the importance of the media, advertising, and propaganda, and this only grew during the Second World War. The profession grew at Excuse me. And in 1948, the UK, um, in the UK, the Institute of Public Relations was formed um, and established um, to, in a sense, um, improve the industry's reputation and help professionalize the industry. In a classically understated tone, the Institute's new journal claimed PR was simply, quote, the provision of help and information to the public by every means, um, every possible means. In 1948, propaganda was negatively associated with Nazism, Stalinism, and American corporate power, so British professionals insisted PR was merely responding to a mature public's demand to be told the truth. PR claimed um, its aim was to teach industry and governments that truth is the best weapon. <laughs> so this image of PR has entered British scholarship which has tended to focus, for example, on the work of left-leaning civil servant Stephen Talents. Here's Talents um, working for the BBC on the top of the slide. So working for the Empire Marketing Board, the General Post Office, and the BBC, Talents promoted the concept of public-private partnerships in a mature capitalist state. Echoing Talents' vision, historians have adopted his language. For example, one noted historian of PR has written that PR was primarily concerned with managing media production and relations and shaping the relationships between different publics or stakeholders, such as shareholders, competitors, suppliers, employees, local and central government, and the local community. A similar language um, circulates in the profession today. And here's some PR from the, um, that I found on the internet that's PR for public relations. So. As you can see, I love this quote on the bottom, PR connects people with shared values through story using all and any form of communication as a conduit to bring about a deep sense of belonging and ultimately peace. So it's a bit of PR certainly. <laughs> um, so let me see, so as I said, it's still very much part of the profession today to argue that you're just providing information, truthful information. PR thus has successful, been successful in selling itself as a necessary adjunct to business and other large organizations in a modern media-saturated world. Of course, critics have consistently denounced PR's practices, practitioners, and its claims. Most famously in the 1950s, Vance Packard suggested that PR was practiced by a motley crew of hustling press agents, lobbyists, readers, and fixers. So think Rudy Giuliani. Uh, similarly, Noam Chomsky warned that PR had become a very large industry, which enabled the business community to control the public mind. In this view, PR created corporate power and produced an uncritical, passive, and easily misled public. It grew out of and with consumer capitalism. Its experts practiced media's dark arts, peddled in lies, and engaged in what is now so commonly referred to as spin or disinformation. More than a form of propaganda or advertising, I argue, PR did shape public policies and perceptions. And whether called spin or information, public relations transformed material realities and power relationships into narratives and images, while always erasing its authority. It placed topics and arguments in the public sphere and provided the language for discussing these topics all the while seeking to go undetected by getting others to be its messengers. Practitioners move between government and industry and often erasing any meaningful distinction between these spheres. They also worked in and for Britain's colonies and dependencies. And after the First World War, the British government, colonial states, political parties, the military, and quasi-state organizations like the Empire Marketing Board developed PR's methods and provided a good deal of job training to young men and women who would go into the business. 
These young PR officers often promoted imperialism and imperial goods and suppressed or managed news about anti-colonial movements and colonial wars in places such as Kenya, Palestine, Cyprus, Malaya, and Rhodesia. Like the officials um, who we know destroyed tens of thousands of colonial documents or buried them in secret archives at Hanslow Park, PR experts controlled the stories various publics received about Africa, South and Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. So the British sugar refining industry was an early adopter of PR and financed its growth in the 1940s. Oh, I just wanted, this is the Empire Marketing Board. You all see these kind of images of the commodity chain um, and the posters of um, that were very prominent in the 30s. And I would say this is definitely PR, but people at the time, the Empire Marketing Board um, personnel didn't think that they were doing PR, just promoting imperial commodities. But let's go to sugar. Um, okay, so the British sugar refining industry, as I said, was an early adopter. And in the aftermath of the Second World War and the landslide labor victory in the 1945 general election, the British sugar industry felt especially under attack. Sugar was still rationed when the Labor Party placed sugar refining on its list of industries it hoped to nationalize in peacetime. Tate and Lyle, a firm that wielded monopolistic power over the sugar industry in Britain, Jamaica, and Trinidad, turned to PR to protect sugar's interests by claiming, by claiming to be defenders of free enterprise. And free enterprise is sort of an updated version of free trade in um, the language. Tate and Lyle's PR relentlessly explained how private interests rather than public bureaucrats would create health, happiness, and progress throughout the British Commonwealth. The corporation, Tate and Lyle explained, was the key to freedom and development at home and abroad. So Tate and Lyle was a relatively new firm formed in 1921 out of a merger of two Victorian family firms, the sugar refiners Henry Tate and Sons and Abram, Abram Lyles and Sons, a shipping firm turned sugar refiner. The new company grew so large that it became the prime target in the late 1940s of labor state a desire to nationalize this industry. To combat this threat, Tate and Lyle hired what has variously been called a pressure group and our PR firm known as Aims of Industry. The relationship became especially close after Lord Lyle, president of Tate and Lyle, became president of Aims of Industry in April of 1949. Here's, oops. There. Okay, <clears throat> so Aims of Industry was started by Hubert Starley of Champion Spark Plugs um, in 1942. And when Starley gathered together leading industrialists concerned about labor's post-war agenda. In addition to fighting state control over industry, increases in taxation on profits and the expansion of the welfare state, these men were worried about the politics of collectivism. Starling, Ames' first director, likely learned a great deal about propaganda and industry when he worked as a personal assistant to Lord Beaverbrook when he was Minister of Supply during the Second World War. Canadian-born press baron Beaverbrook had made his fortune investing in engineering and power companies as well as cement industry and newspapers. After moving to Britain in 1910, Max Aitken, as he was then um, known, joined the Unionist Party and won a seat in the House Thereafter, he became publicist of the First Order, gaining a controlling interest in the Daily Express and creating the Canadian War Records Office in London, which employed the latest propaganda techniques to sell the story of Canada's contribution to the war effort. He was then appointed president of the Board of Trade and in 1917 received a peerage, taking the Canadian sounding title of Beaverbrook. So at the end of the war, he became first minister of information, handling propaganda in, in allied and neutral countries. He expanded his newspaper empire. But Labour's victory um, in 1929 and Beaverbuck's frustrations with conservative leader Stanley Baldwin encouraged him to support independent conservatives and launch, launch what he called an empire crusade in 1929. For a short time, Beaverbrook even created a separate political party of empire crusaders who pressured Baldwin and Tory leadership to adopt protectionism. So I argue that Beaverbrook's heritage got um, taken up by aims of industry, and they took up his skillful propaganda and turned it into the more apolitical sounding public relations. Its aims of industry, as I should say, its financial support and early leadership came from the same sorts of industries Beaverbrook had been involved in, including cement, electricity, the auto industry, as well as food manufacturing and journalism. 
The organization included many Tory MPs, and as one recent historian has shown us, had tremendous influence on policy as it became intertwined with other right-wing pressure groups. In 1948, Ames incorporated, but still claimed to be a non-profit making industrial public relations organization that maintained itself by subscription from big and small firms throughout the country. Aims of industry exists, an early pamphlet claimed, merely to interpret the part played by industry in our national life. As it insisted, it was a non-party body whose aim was to teach the great body of the public, work people and staffs, and even manufacturers, the contribution that industry has made to our standard of living, and thus to Britain's position in the world. The firm used all manner of PR to do battle with socialism, communism, and the Labour Party. Beginning in the 1940s, it published countless pamphlets, books, news articles, produced films and radio broadcasts, organized letter writing campaigns and factory visits and gave endless lectures. It worked closely with trade associations and their conglomerate, the Federation of British Business. Its speakers visited factories and working men's clubs, spoke at women's clubs, chambers of commerce, technical schools, adult education groups, community centers and schools. In other words, Ames distributed PR to men, women, and children throughout the British Isles. In 1949, Tate and Lyle hired Ames to lead its battle against the state. While, provisions, while previous Ames PR had been directed at the business community, politicians, and workers, Ames sugar campaign also targeted consumers, generally described as housewives. Free enterprise became embodied in commodity form as a talking sugar cube, appropriately named Mr. Cube. Um, was figured on as the mascot or spokesman for the campaign. Um, this was not the first time a commodity symbolized free trade, but now refined sugar was standing up to socialism, communism, regulation, bureaucracy, and the welfare state. So beginning, <clears throat> Mr. Cube would utter these slogans such as Tate, not state. And there's a zillion other ones, but all say the same meaning. Um, on the company's sugar packets, on the little packets too, you know, that were on restaurants or these larger um, packages in the press and on um, tons of corporate material as a paper cut out. Oh, and here's a bunch of the different cartoons and slogans um, that you can say, kill the snake state. So it's all this play on the state and tape. Um, but uh, he didn't just end up being a two-dimensional figure. He was a little figurine, a collectible. Um, paper cutouts, he was a character in songs, um, in plays, in games, evidently he was on balloons. Um, Mr. Cube thus saturated the public sphere with his views on industry and its so-called freedoms. And you can see he's a little white knight with his sword defending free enterprise. This campaign was very successful, shifting public opinion and ensuring that labor did not nationalize sugar. Thereafter, Ames went on to mobilize a wide range of industrial and commercial firms to fight labor's regulatory efforts. But this story, I want to argue, has a colonial chapter as well. In addition to its PR, Tate and Lyle defended against labor's attempts to nationalize sugar by developing its West Indian sugar plantations and opening a new um, factory in Monimus, Jamaica in 1949, the exact moment they're engaging in this PR in Britain. Um, which to open uh, move to the empire was following a previous practice of escaping government regulations by investing in the colonies. Indeed, the firm had first purchased had purchased its first West Indian plantations to avoid controls of the beet sugar industry in the 1930s. Just give you a little picture of that. During the next few decades, the company purchased plantations in Belize and Zambia, and refineries and distribution networks in Canada, Nigeria, and Rhodesia. In nearly all these places, the company used PR to confront nationalization efforts, riots, boycotts, strikes, and growing competition with American multinationals. Eventually, sugar was nationalized in Jamaica and Trinidad in the early 1970s. And whether or not it was successful, Tate and Lyle's PR shaped understandings of race and labor, industry, and empire. So Tate and Lyle's corporate PR circulated a powerful narrative that the sugar industry, in private hands, was a force of colonial development and social welfare. In both the so-called developing world and in post-war Britain, pamphlets, films, articles, and multiple pieces of corporate PR asserted that the corporation 
would improve the welfare of plantation workers in the West Indies, factory workers in the United Kingdom, and consumers worldwide. Free enterprise, the, such PR claimed, built modern plantations, factories, and kitchens. It produced good jobs, clean homes, ample leisure time, and delicious things to eat. It had made the empire and it would rebuild Britain. Lord Lyle laid out this case in a speech he gave in December of 1949 at the Savoy Hotel. Responding to a question by a pro-empire activist and politician, Leo Amory, Lord Lyle explained, gentlemen, there is only one real road to recovery, and that is a road open upon which the solid foundations of the British Empire have been built. It is a road of private enterprise, free and individual efforts. That is the road that we have got to travel on. So Lord Lyle implied that as long as business remained in private hands, Britain would rebuild and free enterprise would become a new informal empire. As in this speech, the company's propaganda positioned Tate and Lyle as the glue that held together and improved the colony and metropole. This argument appeared regularly in the Ames of Industry journal Voice of Industry, which circulated to member firms, consumer groups, and politicians. In an early issue of, um, from May of 1949, um, during the first months of this Mr. Cube's national campaign, an article entitled What Monty Musk Means to Monty Musk deployed the farm to table narrative to write a particularly refined history in which sugar united the racially different yet economically interdependent people who lived in Monty Musk, Scotland and its namesake in Jamaica. The article began in Scotland and imagined the journey taken centuries earlier by a young man who set out for Monty Musk to seek his fortune in the Caribbean. Although this white man's identity was long forgotten, we imagine the life of this agent of empire rather than that of African slaves who worked the plantations. Published just after the company purchased the Money Musk Sugar Estate from the American-based United Fruit Company, this article cast Tate and Lyle as the rightful heirs of an historical empire and its modernization project. The main aim of the article, though, was to announce the opening on March 31st, 1949, of the biggest sugar factory and distillery of its kind in the British Commonwealth in Monty Musk, Jamaica. This very expensive new venture, the author explained, increased the Sterling area's sugar output by 40,000 tons a year, saved millions of pounds annually, and along with other Commonwealth supplies would hasten the end of the sugar ration, which did not happen. Sugar was rationed until 1953. Lest we forget, the article noted, too, how this new factory was paid for by private sources and was a product of British, the British spirit of enterprise. This piece of business journalism was also explicitly racist, emphasizing to readers how, quote, an ocean and world of difference in living habits separate the two Monty Musks. Different yet interdependent, the article noted how the white new factory rising to its tall chimney like a huge sugar loaf united the white-skinned reserved Scotsmen and the ebony faces of a volatile childlike people. Written just a year after the Empire Windrush brought several hundred Jamaicans to work in labor scarce Britain, this article told Jamaicans, of course they didn't read it, but <laughs> was telling the idea that they should instead stay at home and work for this British company, in other words, not travel to Britain for work. Deploying popular racism, this piece of PR thus entered debates about migration, decolonization, colonial development, and social welfare. In this piece, we learned just how much better Tate and Lyle's development worked than that, for example, of the state-backed disastrous groundnut scheme in Tanganyika. They just threw it in as an example that state-led projects were um, horrible. This point, of course, underscored once again that the corporation, not the state, would um, control and help a volatile, childlike people who clearly were not ready for independence. From Money Must to Money Must was just a small example of a much larger campaign, which included films as well. The company funded and Aims of Industry distributed an explicitly racist film, um, which was shot in Jamaica in the early summer of 1949 and released in the UK in 1950. The 18 minute film entitled From Cane to Cube was primarily intended for school children in Britain. It was loaned for free from the Films Bureau of Aims of Industry, but it also appeared at many public events um, as part of Ames National Mr. Cube campaign. The film was shown, for example, in a West Indian garden at the British Food Fair at Olympia in the summer of 1950 and also appeared at the Ideal Home Show and the schoolboys own exhibition that year. 
While reminiscent of the famous Song of Ceylon, produced for the tea industry in the early 1930s, and other industrial and imperial documentaries of the era, this film also speaks to the concerns of the late 40s and early 50s. As I play, don't worry, I won't play the whole film. I'm going to play about 10 minutes or so. Um, I want you to notice, of course, the use of music, the narrator's accents, and the sheer racism inherent in the journey of sugar from Jamaica to England. In the first half, the Jamaican sugar cutter, um, who actually I think might the actor, that might be um, the same person that we saw at the very beginning of my talk, whose face is framed. Um, but anyhow, you pay attention, he's asleep in the beginning. Um, he speaks, though, with an accent that isn't Jamaican, but it's actually reminiscent of the antebellum American South. The accent is um, what uh, comes from, or what um, Tom Rice is a scholar, film scholar, suggests was typical of Hollywood films in the 1930s. But I think it's used here for, I, I actually am really con um, interested in what you think about the use of the accent, but it's used here in part to portray Jamaicans as simple, happy workers who know their place in the global economy and in the Commonwealth. Yet no doubt audiences would have also heard slavery's legacies in this voice. And halfway through the film, a white upper class narrator, as the, the film moves from um, Jamaica when it lands at docks in London, you no longer have the Jamaican narrator, you have this upper class white male speaker um, who shows how sugar is, quote, refined and made white and clean by English science, technology, and labor. In other words, through the, the next phases of the refining process. Global color and gender lines are clear here. At Two, as the final section shows beautiful English women workers packing sugar, making it safe, clean, and white for English consumption and for export. The film reiterates the larger point that Tate, not the state, will de develop the empire, reconstruct British industry, and provide worker welfare. So now I'm going to show a clip from the um, film. So I'm going to exit here and then pull up the, let's see if this works. Well, I'm trying to do it to avoid the um, ads as well. So it's on YouTube, of course. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Start of another day. Just another day of cutting that old sugar cane. We're just normal people, you understand? Like working folks all over. Maybe we don't talk the way you people do, but to us it's still the king's English. And well, we kind of like it that way. We don't tell the time by no hands ticking around a clock face. We just watch as the sun. And when he comes up over the treetops, then we just get going to the cane field. <coughs> this estate where I work is called Money Musk. It's just one of the estates that the company have here, but it's the biggest in the island. 
And there sure is a lot of cane. Every place you look, you see that waving cane, just mile after mile of it. Some of it new cane that's still growing. And some of it that me and my gang will be cutting maybe tomorrow. Most of us people lives up in the hills, cause it's cooler up there. And we just come down here for the cutting and lives around the estate. Once we get to the canes here, we are told where to start cutting. And then we just get going. You know, we cane cutters are happy people when we are cutting. There's something good and fine about swinging that old cane knife just where you want it. They say that this cutting ain't easy, but that don't worry me over much. I've been cutting cane since I was knee high to an alligator. And it sure comes just easy to me now. The company pays us cutters for the amount of cane we cut. And they won't stand for no trash bean with the cane. No, sir. You just have to cut off the tops and then take the trash off the sides before you get the cane proper. In the olden days, they used to make the slaves cut all the cane. And all they had were the old mule carts to take it away. It sure must have taken a long time in those days to make that sugar. If there weren't no bees to turn the mill, there weren't no work. And that must have been mighty bad. And when you think how those old sugar boats used to get right across those oceans, boy, they sure must have wanted that sugar. Waiters always look at me <laughs> and think that I'm going to have a little... Let's see. Sorry about that there. Let me see if I can... Well, nope. <laughs> Sorry, I'll just fast forward. There goes the wagon the way to the factory. They haven't got far to go. Just the other side of the river. Well, we call it the river. And they'll be back for more cane. That factory is mighty hungry for cane, and cutters are working all over the place keeping it busy. They never stop night or day. Of course, we cutters don't work nighttime. The cane yards keep plenty cane in store for nighttime. Tractors is only used to haul the cane when the cane fields is near. In some of the rail out of the way fields, they has to load onto the tractors first, and then again onto the trains before it comes to the factory. But no matter how it comes, it's all good cane, and the factory is always waiting for it with its big hungry machine. Okay, I'm gonna move forward. Now I work in that factory over there. It's one of the biggest sugar refineries in Britain, set in the heart of the London docks. You saw the sacks of raw sugar leaving Jamaica. Now I'm going to take up the story here at the wharf, where they're being unloaded. The unloading goes on day and night. We often handle up to 3,000 tons in 24 hours. Raw sugar from Jamaica, Trinidad, and other islands of the West Indies, raw sugar from Cuba and Mauritius, and some raw beet sugar grown at home by our British farmers. Our first job after landing the sacks of sugar is to weigh them and take samples for analysis by our own laboratories and for the customs before emptying the sacks into storage containers, each holding a thousand tons or more. 
At this stage, the raw sugar consists of impure crystals covered with molasses, a dark brown, treacly substance. The first process in the refinery is to remove the layer of molasses. This is done by mixing the raw sugar with hot syrup to soften the molasses. So that when the mixture is fed into these machines, the sugar crystals can be separated. We first pour the mixture, and then, as soon as the machine starts to spin, centrifugal force throws the mixture against the rotating basket, which is a fine sieve. The syrup and molasses pass through the sieve, leaving the sugar crystals behind. With Friends would walk up to me and be like, what the f*** is in your, <laughs> your mug? And I would just tell them, it's mud. Without the dark molasses, the raw sugar now appears a lighter color. We now melt the sugar crystals. Now I'm going to go to the next stage, you'll see. A cooling tunnel so that the sugar sets hard into slabs. The mold is lifted into a centrifugal machine which spins off any remaining syrup. After further drying, the slabs are now ready for cutting into cubes, and they begin their journey through a series of modern machines that do just about everything except drop the lump into your cup of tea. Stop there. Second. Okay. Um, so obviously, we could go on and on uh, talking about the film and the ways in which labor is presented, the ways in which race is presented, the shifting uh, narrative style once we get to written, in which it's sort of this technocratic, uh, scientific um, mode of representation of the processing of sugar until you get to the women who are packing the sugar and then they're just dancing because their labor is so much fun. Um, and that beautiful woman's face, the worker, you know, um, which is interesting because she has her lipstick on and she's smiling and, um, but you never hear a woman's voice. So it's two male voices. And we'll think again, of course, about the oddness of the um, cane sugar cutters voice being American and not Jamaican. Um, but anyhow, we'll kind of think about that. And then um, I'm hoping in the discussion, we can talk about it more. Um, but I want to turn now, I want, it's a good time now, I'll we'll turn back to this sugar worker's face. As I said, I think he's the actor in the film. So maybe not even a sugar worker. Um, but I want to return, you know, as a kind of uh, think about how this PR develops over time. As I said, this came not from 1949, but his photograph was published in, a 1961 special edition of Tate and Lyle's house magazine, the Tate and Lyle Times. And that magazine was circulated to um, men and customers, shareholders, employees, every employee got all this kind of material, technical visitors. And also there were lots of visitors who came to the factories and there were factory tours. So it was handed to them as part of the factory tour. Um, so this is, I want to just show you a couple more. This is a picture from the booklet, again, of the factory, and it's turned into kind of a get part of a tourist culture, really. Here's another one from the same um, 
sorry, from the same booklet. All these pictures are from the booklet. So the booklet then tells a very similar story as the film um, about sugar, British history, free trade, colonial and domestic welfare, but it adds and also pushes the health benefits of eating refined sugar. Um, again, there's in this booklet, no mention of slavery. Um, Whereas you saw in the film, there's a little mention about uh, that was just the old days um, and nothing about how difficult it was. Um, instead, readers learn, though, in the booklet that 18th century sugar refiners fought for free trade against West Indian producers who advocated monopoly. So the image of free trade comes out again. We also see in the booklet um, pictures of bulldozers, for example, again, this kind of modern, the technology, British technology, irrigation systems. Um, so, and then a quote that says, you know, these new modern technologies are turning wild bushes into prosperous croplands, as though they were wild bushes in Jamaica in this period. Um, you see maps, graphs, and photographs of ships illustrating the lines of connection, not only between Jamaica and Britain, but the sources of sugar, in this case, um, going to Britain. And Britain still looks at this as it's though it's the global center of the world economy um, in this map. So readers could also learn about safe and clean workplaces, I'll talk about this good pay, welfare schemes such as marriage grants for women, Christmas and holiday gifts, retirement allowances, prosperity sharing schemes, subsidized meals, amateur dramatics, sort of cultural societies, and numerous sporting events for employees. Um, welfare also occurred in Jamaica, but while Jamaican children um, were able to go to school, <laughs> British children were able to stuff themselves with candy and enjoy puppet shows and pony rides. And so those are kind of contrasting images of children um, in, the, in this booklet. So the booklet dealt then with some of the same, many of the same issues corporate PR had in 1949. But in 1961, it's also fending off nutritionists who were then damning the health effects of consuming refined sugar. The same booklet that celebrated free enterprise, colonial development, and private welfare schemes also championed the consumer's right to eat sweet things. Photographs of tea parties and wedding cakes implied that sugar expressed love. And an article entitled Take Sugar to Keep Slim, written by a dietitian, told people that refined sugar had fewer calories than margarine and provided energy for manual labor and maintained blood sugar levels. And then the dietitian recommend that dieters should eat a little sugar whenever you feel hunger pains to temper your appetite and waistline. Um, I've tried it and it doesn't seem to work. <laughs> so sugar in the booklet though was presented as good for Britain and Britons, even those who needed to shed some extra pounds. So finally eating sugar also helped not only um, the individual slim down, but also helped the empire slim down. And the visitor's book also uh, discussed decolonization and um, particularly congratulated Ghana for having achieved independence and announced that Nigerian self-government was only a matter of time. Um, it offered these country, the companies, quote, best wishes for their progress and prosperity in the future. And indeed, the conglomerate hoped independence would transform Ghana and other post-colonial nations into major consumer markets. Long after he had thwarted labor sugar plans, Mr. Cube then became a corporate mascot and he remained on PR and as I, you could see him on the cover of this booklet, but he also appeared in advertising and he frequently showed up in business magazines. And this is a big from um, a magazine called Achievement. Uh, and he ended up usually encouraging, talking about the history of free trade, encouraging overseas investment and showing up um, in even in the most politically and racially um, oppressive countries such as apartheid era South Africa. And here's a little piece um, about how you shouldn't pay attention to politics in South Africa, you know, investment is, you know, it's PR to invest um, in its modern urbanization and, and industrialization. So um, the Tate and Lyle Times, Mr. Cube, the article from Money Musk to Money Musk and the film from Kane to Cube offered workers, consumers, politicians, and investors a satisfying and comfortable history and geography of sugar in which they learned that the corporation had and continued to, had in the past and would continue to provide for workers and consumers. 
This, of course, was a powerful misinformation campaign since sugar had been especially exploitive and unhealthy industry. Nearly all development efforts were the product of public and private initiative. Since at least the 1930s, sugar could hardly be described as free of government controls. And as one author put it in 1953, the existing structure of the British sugar industry is the direct result of government actions in the past and remains subject to legislative control. Tate and Lyle's PR suppressed this knowledge and instead presented the corporation as better than the state. The smiling face of the unknown sugar worker essentially saying the merits of free enterprise is the key to colonial development. Scholars of decolonization, post-war capitalism, and international relations have long recognized the ways in which large-scale development projects and rhetoric recast imperial relations and ideologies in the middle decades of the 20th century. Africans, West Indians, and South Asians also seized upon development as a strategy to establish legitimacy, attract investment, and stabilize economies. Here, though, we can see how private industry sold the story about development as a capitalist project, a story which many new national leaders accepted. Technocratic and consumer-oriented versions of a modern multinational commonwealth denied centuries of slavery, exploitation, class, and racial struggles. It helped Britons forget the violence of their colonial past while learning how corporations, free trade, and British pioneers had created an especially sweet empire. The corporate PR that I've explored today thus implied that just as the empire was devolving, private corporations would maintain the production, circulation, consumption of sugar, linking, but not literally bringing together white and black workers and consumers. Tate and Lyle's PR thwarted labor's nationalization plans in the UK, but by the early 1970s, both Jamaica and Trinidad nationalized the company's holdings. While it's difficult to measure the success and failures of such PR in the metropole and former colonies, we can conclude that it established new global narratives about Britain and the West Indies during a period in which the relationship between these regions was being dramatically reshaped. It also spread faith in the power of PR. Tate and Lyle's famous motto, Tate, not state, planted the seeds of neoliberalism that thrived during the Thatcher years. So thank you. Let me stop sharing here. Okay, hope we can leave it open for some questions now. Okay, well, thank you very much, Erica. A lot of, um, I was going to say food for thought, but... Um, <laughs> Sugar for um, non-thinking, I suppose, and um, I certainly take sugar to keep slim. Uh, that's something else. Um, the, the floor is open. Uh, there are many tangents that we can go off on, from the raw to the refined to the consumption. Um, so please, can you either raise your hand or put a question in the chat? Uh, yes, Simon. Thanks for this, Erica. This was just a, a brilliant tour de force um, keynote, and there are so many questions um, that I could ask. The one that I wanted to um, ask you was about whether the PR agencies that you look at um, serve as almost kind of um, brokers of how to create these messages between different companies. So you focused on mm -hmm. Tate, Tate and Lyle. Um, but what I'm asking is whether like by building up this repertoire and mm -hmm. this set of racialized images, for example, they can then go see other corporations which are operating in the same kind of mm -hmm. um, decolonizing capitalist global landscape. And in, in a sense, they're almost like refining their um, PR template and then they can roll it out to mm -hmm. client after client. And I asked this question because I know that in the historiography on um, management consulting, that's mm -hmm. very much like what emerges where the consultancies operate almost as kind of intelligence brokers that go to, from company to company, picking up best practice and then mm -hmm. kind of turning it into a template that they can then sell to other clients. Does, does that make sense? Yes. And actually, that is really a perfect question because that's really exactly what I'm hoping to do in the project. So they exactly, they um, 
this is one of the first, you know, where they're sort of figuring out how do we combat nationalization? Then they take the exact same work and they bring it to the empire or any place that nationalization is threatened. So that, you know, they were like literally experts on fighting nationalization. Then there are experts that um, did, you know, kind of fought labor struggles and things like that. Um, but you're absolutely right. And that's what makes them different than earlier promoters. So obviously they're earlier kind of examples of promotion of commodities. But up until at least the 30s, usually they came out of the industry. So they had very specialized knowledge about that particular industry. Mm -hmm. Now these guys, especially um, developed in the, actually with the, the Empire Marketing Board was really important, but then it's a lot of those people went on to other industries. Um, and during the war, they worked in a lot of the wartime um, ministries of information, et cetera. They just became these experts on you know, literally PR and how, how to frame an image, what image of labor do you want, you know? And so, yeah, well, I think what I'm going to see is repetition across mm -hmm. um, and they move and they'll sell anything, you know? So that's the difference. And I think that's true of market researchers and consultants. There's a kind of shift to their expertise is selling only these guys' expertise is selling global, you know, how do you deal with um, the empire or another place, which they'll start to talk about developing countries or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but they also work in um, outside of the British Empire. So the interesting thing is they'll work for um, one guy I have. He worked for every right wing government you could possibly imagine. Right. Everyone, <laughs> including, you know, fascist governments, you know, Franco, et cetera. So they're like a right wing shock troops, too. You know? Yeah, that's so interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, we have a question from Zach. Zach then. who seems to be muted. <laughs> no? <laughs> um. yes. Hi, so this is actually not Zach Hung. This is Arunava. I don't know if you can see me. OK, you can see my body now. Hi, Erica. But thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm here with my class, actually. Uh, which is studying British Empire. Thank you for that fascinating talk. I wanted to ask you, you know, how are you placing emotions in this project? Because, you know, in that smiley face of the mm. labor, you know, the empire is, I mean, the PR people are using emotions clearly to send out their emotions and kind of mobilize the audience towards their own project. So that's one, like, how, how do you navigate the emotions in that? And another is like a comment, not a question. It's um, um, how the PR itself was producing a product of its own, like the figurine, mm -hmm. right? It was a product of its own. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, it, yeah, if you could just comment on that. Sure, and thank you to your students for coming. I think I see them, <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah, I mean, the emotions, I really think that's really important. They start to develop and you can, especially with the film. So the picture of the smiling worker is, is powerful, but the music used in the film evokes emotion on this really powerful level that's different than the sort of earlier visual culture, you know, so the shifting music, et cetera. And so I do think I'm interested in how they learned how to use emotions and, you know, where that came from. Um, the thing that they do that's PR is different than advertising or straightforward um, propaganda is that the trick with PR is you get your story and then you get others to tell your story. So you place news articles, they look like news um, or um, so, you know, it's not signed. <laughs> you have to kind of it's really tricky. It actually presents a really interesting research problem because it's hard to find the authors know what's PR, what isn't. Um, but um, so I think that helps. So they use friendship rather. I mean, so that's the emotions of friendship or, um, you know, it's just like social media. Now people, you know, that you think you're getting information from, you know, you think, you know, the source, but you don't. So I think it's using um, the kind of social inform like it's not just friendship, but kind of social networks among um, communities as well. So, but I, the emotions is really powerful. And actually, as I caught a hold of the film, you can just see it. I was like, here I am dancing to the cutting of sugar cubes. You can't help yourself. And so thinking about uh, modern media technologies that have, especially sound, are really important. Thank you so much, Erica. Uh, yes, I see the hands up of William and then uh, Shreyashi. So we'll take both of those questions. 
William? Uh, yes, I was just wondering um, from that really interesting film, was there any attempts made to um, justify the fact that final refining didn't happen in Jamaica, uh, which would be an obvious developmental mm -hmm. thing to do, so to speak? And I mean, if not, why not? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a really interesting point, because when I first was reading about the new refinery in, in Jamaica, I thought, are they doing the finished refining there? Um, and I they set it up. So the interesting thing is they set it up so it could be done there mm -hmm. if refining was nationalized in Britain. So that was very clever. You know, they're sort of laying the groundwork um, to avoid the labor controls in Britain. Of course, they run into other problems. But I think that's what, but, you know, refining, as you say, like it always happens. I think part of it is they're justifying still doing the finished refining in Britain because that's employing all these British workers, you know, the dock workers, the all the ones you see in the film. So this is also a story told to workers, very much yeah. so. Um, but it's, it's interesting because it's like, um, you notice they use the word, I wouldn't have noticed it unless it was this conference, that raw sugar comes yeah. to Britain. It's not raw, it's already in sacks. So that mm -hmm. it's really interesting, but they are using the word raw too. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Sriyashi. Uh, no, Sriyashi, your sound isn't working again. You might try clicking on the um, your mic a couple times. That seems to work for me. Sorry for this. Um, am I audible oh, right go. now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, it is something that I, I got intrigued that you have talked about the West Indian and the Jamaican uh, sugar plantation and how it uh, and how uh, this worked. But I would like to know, or this is maybe it may sound silly, that about the Indian uh, sugar plantation and that is also a part of the uh, since uh, we know that from 19th century onwards, uh, Indian sugar plantation and that actually was a part of the British uh, British uh, uh, capitalist. Uh, enterprise. So, uh, do you find any kind of uh, uh, broadcasting uh, in this particular, uh, in the context of India, or also I would like to know uh, any any kind of uh, nationalist, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, struggle or discontent regarding this? Means it may sound silly, but I'm uh, I would like to know the Indian context, or do you find any kind of uh, relation in this the Indian sugar plantation, which also developed under the aegis of the uh, mm -hmm. of the British? Colonial uh, masters, but however, we know even today the the area of Uttar Pradesh remains to be one of the most important hub of sugar plantations. Sugar, uh, right? Of course. Yeah, I mean that really reminds me that what's really critical, of course, this film was made, you know, it literally in the spring of 1949, and they're deliberately not talking about India because what they're emphasizing this is the general move from India to Africa and the West Indies is still part of the, you know. Uh, older empire, I guess, what they're thinking in this period. So it's a deliberate, like, uh, suppression of knowledge of that sugar production and what's going to happen to it. But I am going to deal with India, but I'm thinking of it in a different way, which is in India, um, the British, I found all these amazing files in which the British are very angry about the PR that the Americans are doing <laughs> to open up American markets in India. And there's so angry and it happens starting in the war actually during the war the americans uh are already map, you know starting pr and they even basically said um in one of their pr campaigns in 1942 in india this american big whole ad said oh we broke through free from the empire you can too and the british are like what are we doing we can censor indian press that's ridiculous and the answer was, you know, to keep Indians fighting, we need to have them think they're supporting the Americans, not us, because they all hate us. So really interesting discussion. So I'm really fascinated in the way in which the Americans are envisioning India, but then also Indians. Um, there's a lot of pro-British PR in India after independence. And then, of course, Indian corporations, especially the big multinationals like Tata, et cetera, then they hire the same guys and then they nationalize. They tend to use it to nationalize particular commodities. So I'll see how that plays out, but it was really unexpected. Um, I have to say, I was like so shocked that the Americans were so ballsy, but I don't know why I should be shocked by that. 
But the British knew full well that you needed PR to protect their imperial markets, even after independence. So it should be interesting. Um, that's the research that I need to continue this year, though. <laughs> <coughs> I don't see a, a hand up for now, so I'm going to ask myself. Um, I have two questions, really. One is to do with nationalization. Um, how serious was the attempt to nationalize sugar along, or any other um, sector along with those that we know mm -hmm. uh, in the public services were nationalized? Thinking of the British in Britain at the moment. Um, and the other is, um, I was really interested that they had the propaganda, take sugar to keep slim. Um, <laughs> so what, is this responding to pressures that were building up about sugar? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm mindful that it was, you know, in the 50s when tobacco was very definitely mm -hmm. in the sights of science as something that we shouldn't be doing, we shouldn't be smoking, et cetera, et cetera. So, mm. but it's taken a long time for a real public debate on sugar. So uh, how were those two things playing out at the time of the video and the PR? Yeah, that's interesting. I think the, the first question, you know, how serious was the um, labor plans to nationalize sugar was very serious. They put it in all their kind of platforms and, uh, and the campaign, the sort of Mr. Q campaign was very expensive and extremely national. So every person that opened up, and you know, Tate Lyle really was the main sugar that people used in Britain. You know, they get their little sugar packet and read that, um, you know, those phrases. <clears throat> and evidently there were consumers that then started getting active and, and fighting nationalization. So it seems to have worked. Um, and, labor backed off of other proposals to nationalize consumer um, products, you know, those kinds of industries. So they did, you know, like thinking more about transportation or other things, which still also there was um, PR against all those efforts. Like even the National Health Service, there was PR trying to fight the NHS. But so it was very serious, or at least Tate and Lyle believed it was serious. That's the thing. They, that's the kind of idea of like, they think capitalism is in crisis. In retrospect, it doesn't look so bad. But um, at the time, I think they really believed it and to spend enough money in order to fight this. Um, so I think in that sense, you know, the idea is it's like whether or not it really was going to happen. It ended up putting a lot of money in the coffers of the PR firms, you know, and sort of like helps the, that industry. Um, so that's kind of, um, you know, kind of critical in a way. It's like whether it happens or not, it helps. That's what I sort of argued in my tea book. That's like whether or not you're able to sell tea certainly help the advertising industry everywhere. You know, they usually go where there's a problem. So that's, kind of, you know, it's uh, interesting in that way. And then as far as the dietitians, I want to look a little more, but there's a really good book on artificial sweetener that I need to jump into again by Carolyn de la Pena, who... Um, I think it is exactly in this period where refined sugar starts coming under attack. And then I've always been interested in the political power of the food industry. And so in a way, I think how the sugar industry is able to fend off that attack and get sugar. So of course, it's in every practically processed food too, you know, so even when you think you're not eating sugar, it's there. Um, but I think what's interesting about PR is they started using it for every problem you know, and sort of using it for, you know, like the same, maybe the same corporation. Okay, now we have this problem. Let's, you know, keep the image of sugar positive. So um, it, that's going to be interesting. I wanted to look more at that. I wish it were true that sugar helps you lose weight, but, you know, <laughs> and there are plenty, there are actually even recipes in that booklet too. So how to use a lot of sugar, you know, that classic food industry recipe. Yeah. They're using PR against climate change as well, of course. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Present day. Um, uh, hand raised, Katya Maslakowski. Um, hi, sorry about uh, not having my uh, video on. It apparently turns on and off by itself. So I'm just gonna leave it alone. Um, thank you so much for an incredibly interesting talk. Um, your last comments about how they use uh, PR for every problem is really interesting to me because it's sort of the portability of this expertise um, as it becomes global is fascinating. Um, 
But the question I wanted, I wanted to return to your comments about the um, accents uh, in the film, because that's super fascinating stuff. Um, because both the accents are wrong, right? Uh, yeah. The first accent is clearly not Jamaican, and the second accent is clearly not uh, somebody who works at like a dock sugar refinery. <laughs> exactly. <working place. clears throat> um, and so what I was thinking about this is that I, I think the um, it just made me feel like the first accent was very much like blackface minstrel performances, right? Mm. Without, uh, you know, a sort of more refined version of that sort of Song of the South S. <laughs> Uh, yeah. black voice um, that is popular in Empire during this period. There's a woman mm. who recently wrote um, a book on uh, blackface minstrels performances uh, that include uh, black people playing uh, uh, blackface minstrels um, in South Africa. I'll send you an email mm. about, about it. Right. Um, but, uh, and then the, the white accent just makes me think this is more of that technocratic uh, you know, everything that happens on the on the British side is part of this future modern. And it's mm -hmm. the same with the music. You've got that slow music in in yeah, Jamaica. Yeah. And then you've got that sort of modern tempo music that's happening in in Britain. It's it's the past mm -hmm. and the future. If that makes oh, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's really helpful. That's why I wanted to show the film because I'm just like I was so shocked by the just racism of that early accent. I couldn't get it was difficult to get past that, you know, and interrogate it. But of course, it's an upper class white accent, and then you don't hear the women at all, you know, so that they're, it's this male voice. But um, yeah, it was shocking. I, I don't understand how audiences in Britain, they might not have been familiar yet with a Jamaican accent, but they certainly would have been familiar with that upper class accent, not being a sugar worker, unless he was the scientist. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Also, knee high to an alligator was in there. Which was <laughs> exactly. Like <laughs> what? what is that doing there? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I see Simon has his hand again. <coughs> and uh, and uh, Kauri. I I, it's not a question for me. I just wanted to flag that there are a couple of questions in the chat box from mm. Logan Chamino and, and from uh, Gillian McGillivray. Oh. Um, I don't know, uh, Erica, if you want to um, take a look at. A quick yeah, look at I just realized that too. <laughs> Um, oh, you want see. to read them out, Simon? I mean, I was about to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can read them out. So uh, Logan says, uh, uh, hello, Erica, what an amazing presentation. I'm just curious, uh, throughout your research thus far, has it seemed that many of these British PR men slash people are in a close knit group similar mm -hmm. to the top 1%? I'm interested if PR movements across decolonizing Britain were concentrated in a similar way that we see in places like Hollywood, Palm Springs. And then Gillian says, such a fascinating talk. Were there huge debates over whether the sugar should be sourced from beet farmers versus uh, colonies slash former mm -hmm. colonies? Yeah. Okay, I'll just take those. I haven't seen the debates about the beet versus colonies, but I think that the beet farmers, I suspect they're worried because, if, again, if it's nationalized, they're just trying to build up the colonial mindset at this point, thinking that sugar might be moving. Again, it's sort of using um, the colonies as a sort of form of um, I guess globalization as a way of avoiding labor politics, you know, so I'm not sure yet, but I was thinking about that question. Um, Logan knows that I'm actually working on Palm Springs too, because uh, the people who developed the tourist resorts in the Kenyan highlands were also developed Palm Springs and Las Vegas, and they were American nexus. So I'm trying to figure out, at first I was very ambitious and I wanted to do like a whole social networking and map out who these people are. I'm not sure I have that in me, but I think I'm gonna do select, try to map out exactly who these people are, where they come from. I know some of them early on, you know, the kind of early generation, I can trace where they came from, um, what industries they're involved in. Many of them had been colonial businessmen or officials that are looking for work. You know, it's the typical, they don't do what, um, like Joe Hodges, you know, in his book, he shows they move into um, UN organizations and those other international organizations. They don't, they use their imperial expertise to try to um, say, lobby business, you know, their kind of business expertise. And I think we've missed that, you know, that, and so think that they're sort of more get involved in humanitarianism. My guys are not like that. So 
Um, but I don't know yet how much they know each other or move around. So I am, I want to do like a social history chapter where I can kind of follow them. The one striking thing I did find is that there are a lot of women, young women that move into this um, business. And that's somewhat unusual. I mean, there's some women in advertising, but I think it's because of the war and a lot of the things, uh, the men were busy, but I have the employees in one, in the kind of colonial office information sector um, right after the war were all women and one West Indian actually, and a white manager. So I'm also very interested in the gender. Does this may open up? And now we have all these women who lived in the empire peddling their knowledge. Um, the most famous of those is Elizabeth Huxley, who actually did work in, um, in the BBC, did all kinds of PR as well as her more public, you know, the novels and what have you, but there are plenty more like that. Okay, Tehila, you want to ask your question and then Kauri? Yes, thank you. Hi, Erica. It's really good to Hi. see you and thank you for a fascinating talk. It's been a pleasure to see how the project has developed. Um, I don't know if I've missed this because I've joined a couple of minutes um, later, but I, I was wondering if you're looking at all and the relationship or if there is any influence by PR firms to the making of the sugar commodity agreements. So um, one of the things that appear in my research on the 70s is how mm -hmm. lots of humanitarians are trying to revise commodity agreements, especially mm -hmm. of sugar, coffee, and tea, um, as mm -hmm. Britain joins the European Economic community mm -hmm. and influenced by the NIO, they're trying to kind of rethink commodity agreements. And that's where kind of mm -hmm. sugar appears in, 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 in my work. And, and it's really interesting because, because they're sort of defending this kind of um, uh, a right or a certain moral uh, obligation towards the former empire and especially mm -hmm. the Caribbean. So I was just wondering if there is a way in which PR firms or if you've seen it intersecting in the earlier period in like mm -hmm. 51 when the sugar commodity agreement is being signed because that would be like a really interesting crossover where yeah. lots of um, anti-colonial interest or decolonizing interest would actually intersect with lots of imperial mm -hmm. interest in, in a weird way. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if, if this is something that your research includes. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to look into that. I haven't seen it yet, but I suspect it. <clears throat> but the problem is they're trying to probably fight those commodity agreements. Although I'm not sure because, you know, the imperial preference stuff, it's like, it is um, this whole, the myth of free trade, you know, they know that that's a myth too, you know, and they use it in their own interest. So I think that would be really interesting to think about. I was thinking about ending this project in the 70s because I do think it's the point that the British side of the story disappears, you know, and their control is gone. Um, and so I want to tell, you know, and it turns into these other international organizations that are controlling these commodity trades, the EU, um, you know, those kinds of things. And just because I wanted to write a smaller book with only a few decades, but um, I have a feeling that's not going to happen. <laughs> but that's a super interesting idea of how are they dealing with these kind of international pol political questions. Um, so I will look for it. <laughs> Thank you. Kauri? Yeah, I wonder if you are going to be using soft PR. One of the most effective forms of soft PR was recipes. They mm -hmm. took Kate and Lyle. They did millions of things. Millions. Here's, you know, here's an American version of, of something. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, God, where's the... You know what? I'll scan it and send it to you. This oh, one great. is actually um, General Foods, so it's not mm -hmm. Kate and Lyle. But it's the same thing, and they use colonial um, and even racist imagery, but in a very mm -hmm. seductive way. But the idea is that you get the product into the home, mm -hmm. um, on the table, and then it becomes irresistible. And what, once you get in on that level, it's much more effective than any kind of, you know, straight text PR. And Tate and Lyle just turned out tons of the stuff. Tons of it, yeah. Um, yeah, I've collected some of their cookbooks. And oh, they're very, very funny because, of, the, of course, you know, all the food industry is massive amounts of whatever product you're selling. But I think what's really interesting is that... Um, that is soft PR, but I think we haven't looked at that enough within the context of the political economic debates that are happening. So what Tate and Lyle wanted consumers to do wasn't just eat their sugar, but vote for their politicians or lobby, you know, write to their politicians. They really want to develop a kind of consumer 
um, politics, which of course we know the left and the right did use, but the right starts to use it even more effectively. There's some work on the conservative party and the way in which they use consumption to get support from women. And I think it's true, they have the recipes, but they also went and spoke at like the Women's Institute and you know, <laughs> jam in Jerusalem. So I think it'll be really interesting to find what's the political story behind, you know, the recipe. And it's hard to tell from that cookbook, you know, they're just selling sugar, but I'm, they're actually selling an industry, not just mm. like sugar itself. So that's the, you know, interesting thing. And it fits with all this other PR. Um, but yeah, I've been collecting those recipes, which are not good for you. <laughs> yeah. There's, um, Yelmer's put a, a little thing in the chat, mm. but he thinks in Portugal, the sugar industry claims sugar helped with digestion after. Yeah. Uh, Doesn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you'll have to follow up on that one. Yeah, uh, it is. It, you know, it's fascinating the way they'll call on the, the scientific studies or, um, you know, of course, all the food industry does that now. They'll use science um, and fun science. And it's, again, part of these PR think tanks thought about doing, you know, they definitely were conscious about it. So that's funny. I'll have to look at that, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just just a follow up on your own point that that, that there were these claims. It also reminds me of um, what's his name? Is it Elmore's book on uh, Citizen Coke? Yes. Where yeah, Coca -Cola yeah. Had this, I mean, they massively mm. campaigned on health grounds, right? So, mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for this fascinating. Uh, I was also thinking, I mean, that goes back to Simon's uh, initial point, like if this was sort of industry-wide or, or company-based. I mean, it's it's in a way also part of sort of the end of the commodity chain. So if you, if, if you go to like, if you find company archives that are still fairly intact, like like the Dutch coffee company, Dow Egbert, Mm -hmm. You have all the segments of the commodity chain in the archive and, mm. and marketing and PR is sort of at, at the, the, the final department, right? And mm -hmm. it's, also, it's also part of the, the, the making of a commodity, except that, mm -hmm. uh, anyways, yeah, small reflection. That's really helpful to think about where it is in the commodity chain. And there might be other points because they'll work on, um, oh, you know, choices to source one sugar versus another, perhaps, you know, I mean, I'm just guessing, but it might be that it's influencing different parts, but it's certainly the last department. You're right. And like Unilever has a big department. Um, I'm hoping to get into the Tate and Lyle archives, but I haven't managed it yet because of COVID, but um, that should be fun. <laughs> and of course, um, I should say the Tate Museum is a huge, you know, part of the marketing. So it'd be interesting to think about philanthropy as part of the story too. And patronage, I should say. Yeah. There's also the extent to which sugar has been put into so many other foods and especially pre-packaged foods that in the end, maybe the PR isn't such an important issue. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So pervasive. Uh, but I wanted to share this uh, Jacqueline Carroll put uh, in the chat. Words to one of the tunes in the film says, give me back oh. feeling with the lion upon it. It was actually a way it was actually as a way of using local Jamaican mentor music to say <laughs> that you want the British money to still be. Oh, that's it. interesting. Thank you. Mm. Huh. Just your, your point, Jean, that's really interesting is that's why I don't want to do a whole project on sugar because it does go everywhere. Like its end uses is just so pervasive. Whereas tea, I always thought it was interesting that there's very little you do with tea other than drink it. You know, and that's why our advertising was so important because you need to make more consumers. You know, it goes into a little dessert or this or that, but there's no byproducts. There's no, you know, it's the difference of the commodity is really um, fascinating. And so uh, that's why I'm like, I'm not going to write a whole book on sugar because of that. <laughs> um, well, but no, it I just mean, goes everywhere. Yeah. I mean, the nutritionists, you know, I mean, by the time you've had a juice in the morning, you've had your day's quota. So, yeah. Um, you know, anything that's mm. prepared. Uh, I'm very aware that it's one minute to sit. Oh. We've been going for an hour and a half. Uh, if there is, and also after all our workshop sessions, I don't see another hand up. I'm not, I don't think I've missed anything in the chat. So can we just give Erica a big round of applause? And... Those of you who are uh, part of our workshop tomorrow, oh, lots of hands now, because we've been, uh, I'm assuming it's not just 
Um, and uh, those of us who are in the workshop, we'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs>